Good afternoon. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. We have a return visit from Mark Albertson, our resident historian who um, has been on the show, as you know, a number of times, talking about a lot of different things. And we were talking about last night about, um, about the field of Republican candidates. So we strayed on to the, um, a discussion about uh, Marxism and communism and uh, socialism. And uh, for those of you that might have missed a little bit of that or, or it escaped you a bit, um, let's go back to that. Right. Socialism. What is socialism? Well, socialism is, uh, is, is given a, uh, a bad rap here. I mean, I'm, personally, I'm not a socialist, but uh, you know, the, are, are there certain aspects of socialism that are, that are, uh, that are fetching? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. How so? Well, socialism, uh, first of all, it, it, I have to understand what it is, as opposed to what Glenn Beck is saying about you know, Obama, well, he was saying about Obama. Yeah. You know, you get that. Well, that was last week. Yeah, you know, every week it, at one point it was he was a socialist, he was a Marxist, he was a communist, and they throw these terms out, mm -hmm. and people get confused about this. Yeah, I guess that's that's the whole point. Well, of course it is, uh, but but socialism has was, was is given a bad rap here uh, mm -hmm. through misunderstanding. I mean, most Americans, I'm sure, don't understand what socialism is, and when social socialism is. Uh, the common ownership of the means of production, mm -hmm. land and capital, uh, the common ownership of the, of the means of getting production, we'll the fruits of production, to market. And you could have some uh, offshoots of a socialist society, such as a, a public education, uh, common ownership of, of utilities, mm -hmm. uh, public ownership, perhaps, of, of, uh, of, yeah. of, of, of health care. Yeah. Uh, we've had public education here for years, and it worked fine. Until, <laughs> uh, but um, as opposed to uh, a Marxism, which believes in the violent overthrow uh, of of society, mm -hmm. uh, to you know where the proletarians will over or overthrow the bourgeoisie, and you would have a dictatorship of the proletariat until the bourgeois society is, is, is uh, withers away or disappears. Now, the bourgeoisie were they the uh, the landowners, the factory owners? Were they the more? They were the right, the ruling yeah. class, and the proletarians were supposedly the workers, and they would overthrow and make this workers' paradise where everyone would be equal. But, but of course, one big difference is Marxists don't believe, you know, true Marxists don't believe in private property, mm -hmm. as opposed to socialists who have no problem with uh, private property. And socialists believe mm -hmm. in the peaceful assimilation of society into this socialist state. Bernie Sanders in Vermont, mm -hmm. senator from Vermont. What's your opinion on him, the notion that he's a socialist? I don't, I, well, I don't think Bernie Sanders is, 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 is a true socialist in the accepted sense of the word. Mm -hmm. um, I, do I believe he's more of a progressive, you know, in the American sense of the word? Yeah, I think he's that. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a true socialist, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's a true socialist. Uh, you know, s socialism prior to the First World War w had, was more of a... Had more of a global view to it, mm -hmm. but the First World War changed socialism because all these socialists became flaming nationalists uh, at okay. that point. And uh, so nationalism trumped the uh, the notion of socialism. Correct, a going bit. to war in the First World War. Yeah. However, there were guys like who was it? Robert Grimm, Switzerland, uh, Lenin stuck mm -hmm. to the principles, uh, saying that, th that this was you know a, 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 a corporate inspired war, the bankers, so on and so forth. And sticking to his principles, he emerged. He eventually emerged victorious in Russia, mm -hmm. which be later became the Soviet Union with the Bolshevik movement. Yeah. But um, you know, following the Second World War, yes, you had at this point where many of these socialist ideas took effect in Europe, and mainly for that, re mainly because of the fact you know that the Europe had been through two world wars. You know, and when you lose 50, 60, 65 million people, yeah. then maybe you begin to say, well, maybe we ought to treat each other with greater respect. We didn't have that here. There was great devastation in Europe, which, Correct. We, which we did not have. Well, we've escaped here. that. Yeah. So we, have, we still have this, more of this individualistic approach to solving problems where the Europeans, uh, having had two world wars in their soil, plus if you go back to the Napoleonic Wars, which upwards of, you know, that, the, the great French, the, the, the French Revolutionary Wars, Napoleonic Wars, where you had maybe almost over, over or over six million people dying, throw that into the equation, yeah, then maybe over the long term, gee, we better treat each other with greater respect if so, we're going to solve these problems. Yeah, so they barely had a breath in Europe between, between wars. 
Correct. Well, you had the 19th century where you had uh, where you didn't have uh, mm-hmm. big wars going on between 1815 and 1914. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that that's the result of the tr- of the uh, of the the Congress in Vienna and also uh, later in Paris when Napoleon made his second comeback. But uh, yeah, through most of the the, the the 19th century, Europe didn't have uh, huge wars. You know, not counting the revolutions or not counting the the Crimean War, 1854, 1856. But when the First World War came along. Yeah, but socialism was one of those things that was spawned with the French Revolution. Uh, socialism, liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, there's a big one. Nationalism, there's a big one. Uh, the snowballing of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you have the rise of the middle class, the rise of this clique of rich, which was going to uh, uh, overturn the nobility. But at the same time, the regal systems were trying to maintain power. So by the time 1914 comes along, they're totally outmoded at this point. There's too many of these new movements coming along. You don't have that balance anymore with the uh, we're, 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 uh, regality where the, the kings and queens really don't have a place in the world anymore for the most right. part, except perhaps as, um, as figureheads. As, right. as, and in 1918, grand, they collapse. Grand. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that breeds this whole... Uh, it's a it's a political collapse actually. So the whole world the, the world political system is turned upside down because at that point that's that's you know uh, the, the the focal point of politics was still in Europe. Mm. Uh, most of the countries that were engaged in militarism were still European. Uh, co- colonial uh, colonial uh, you know building these colonial empires were still still centered in Europe. Although the United States and Japan had jumped into that game too, but it's this it's this. It's this mass political collapse that later spawns Bolshevism, fascism, uh, Nazism, Japanese militarism, this type of thing. But socialism emerges from this uh, uh, as a as a movement that after the first after the Second World War, yeah, it, it begins to grab on, and it really begins to grab on in Europe, where you had a national health care system like in Britain. Yeah. But it's not like we say here they're all socialistic. No, they have private health care systems in Europe. You know, in most of these countries, you have a choice. You so, can, so if you're wealthy, you you can you can do the sure the extra extra. Sure. I mean, in Britain. Yeah, stuff. they have a national health service, but there are people who opt to have a private plan mm-hmm. or someone who wants to take advantage of using both. So, so it's not like it's like, not like it's put forth here by some of these presidential candidates. Now, again, again, words again sometimes convey different meanings at different times in history and, right. and, and can be very powerful things. Now, the, the Nazi Party was known as the, uh, there was the word socialist is in there somewhere. National Socialist German Workers Party. Okay, N S D A P. Okay, now Nazi for short. Now, a lot of people look at that in retrospect and see, and of course, all they see is the word socialist. So they think of the um, the, the Nazis as as being socialist. So if you want to, you want to hmm. draw that comparison, and you want to offend somebody with words, you can. Uh, you can say they're a Nazi, they're, they're, they're a socialist. There, there's some, somehow, um, how does this all break down? Break down this whole notion of um, that party. The, the, the Nazi party? Well, the optimum word here yeah. is national. national. Nationalist. Okay, so there. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's, it's fascist, so it's nationalist. I mean, Hitler used the word socialist to draw in the workers. Mm-hmm. Uh, was he for the workers? No. You know, he got he got the power because he he formed that coalition with the bankers and the industrialists and the mm-hmm. Prussian Junkers, the general staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, he was used by those people, or they were going to use him to hold off uh, the, the the leftists or the more progressive types in Germany, uh, the the, the rot. Kampfverband, the Red Front of the communist, the German Communist Party. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had a lot of those beer hall brawls with the with the SA or SA, the Sturmabteilung, mm-hmm. which were the which were the beer hall brawlers of the Nazi Party. Okay, yeah. But even in the Nazi Party, you had a more, if you want to call it that, a progressive wing. One of those was Ernst Röhm. Now, Ernst Röhm was stop chief or or or, or station or chief of the SA. Uh, which you know, uh, Rum had to leave Germany. He went to Bol- he went to Bolivia uh, for a while. He was a World War One vet, but Hitler called him back because he was a great organizer. He is one of those Nazis that's kind of forgotten after 1934, which is understandable because 1934 he was murdered. <laughs> uh, that'll the, the, put a that'll put a damper on your resume. Yeah, that, yeah, that'll end the career real quick. Uh, the, the night of the Long Knives Purge of, Jan- mm-hmm. of June 30 uh, to July 1st, 1934. 
And Ernst Röhm had a, had a uh, private army, if you will, of like, some up, upwards of three million. And you know he wanted it uh, imbu- he wanted it assimilated into the army. Now you're talking about having a regular run of the mill people being put into the army, but not quite under the un- under the thumb of the Prussian Junkers, which the general staff was made up of. And they're not going to go with the gutter types. That's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. These are, these are people who are extreme reactionary. Not going to happen. They're not going to have an Ernst Room in a command position in the German army. Well, it I thought politics was complicated nowadays. This is this. So you're you're we're, uh, we're hearing things from a lot of different perspectives. Oh yeah, and a lot of different subgroups within a group that we're that we're seeing because of that nationalist overtone. And of course, Correct. Germany had been through, you know, they, they were, had been through World War I. They, uh, they, they were beaten. They lost. Bad, be, they lost badly in World Correct. War I. Uh, economy devastated. And, and marginalized. Yeah. You know, this is what happened at Versailles. Unlike, unlike the, uh, the... The Treaty of Versailles, yeah. Right, the Treaty of Versailles. Un- unlike the Congress of Vienna, mm-hmm. where the idea was to reinstall the Bourbons back on the throne mm-hmm. and bring them back into Europe to maintain a balance of power, which is what the Regals wanted. Mm-hmm. The Regals back in 1814-15 did not want these ideas spawned from the French Revolution to take root and spread, which is why they made this balance of power. This was not done at Versailles. Germany was ostracized mm-hmm. at Versailles. They weren't going to be assimilated into Europe. You know, the French didn't want this. The French were looking for a cordon sanitaire. They actually wanted to take Germany apart mm-hmm. and make it a bunch of city states again. Britain didn't want that. They wanted a viable. They wanted a viable Germany, and, the, and Churchill wanted this at the end of the Second World War too. They wanted a viable Germany as a bulwark to what? Bolshevik Russia. Okay, the communists, yeah. Correct. It goes back to that again. And if you look after the war, people like uh, the, the DuPonts and people like Henry Ford, uh, yeah, they supported the fascists in Italy and they supported the not, later the Nazis in Germany. Why? Because they were a bulwark to the so-called communist, the threat of the communists. They were the enemy of their enemy. Correct. So that's why when you go back to 1933, you know, you see the business plot in this country where they wanted to depose Franklin D. Roosevelt, put Smedley Darlington Butler, mm-hmm. that, that great Marine, uh, in command of the country. Of course, he would be just a, a puppet for them anyway. You find that DuPonts were involved. You find that Pitcairns from Pennsylvania were involved. You find that uh, George Bush's grandfather, Prescott, was involved mm-hmm. in this. Yep. Uh, you, if you read the mccormick Dickstein Committee of 1934... Uh, John McCormick and Samuel Dickstein. John McCormick later becomes chief speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. Uh, Samuel Dickstein later becomes chief speaker of the New York Supreme Court. And this was uh, the McCormick-Dickstein Committee was the House of Un-American Activities Committee before McCarthy comes along. Mm -hmm. And Uh, becomes the face of that. Correct. But we have investigations of House of Un-American Activities, uh, you know, this this committee, long before uh, uh, McCarthy comes along, but uh, that was a more of a fascist look, uh, a, a look into fascism in this country, as opposed to what a more of a look into a leftist bent in this country in the fifties. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is where they bring they blackball certain actors and actresses and so on and so forth. And turn people against people. Correct. But in the German experience, yeah. There was this, uh, if you want to call it a, progr- a, a leftist movement in the Nazi party, which was not only Ernst Röhm, but the Strasser brothers, Gregor and Otto. And in the purge of 1934, where Hitler made that the deal with the bankers and the industrialists and the army, uh, yeah, if he was going to keep power, he's got he's to have these people on his side. He knew that. He wasn't stupid. Uh, so Röhm had to go. And room being a homosexual doesn't play well either, uh, and a lot of the high-ranking yeah. SA were homosexuals, which Hitler didn't seem it didn't seem to bother him before uh, June 30, 1934. But if he's going to have a if he's going to make that deal for power mm-hmm. uh, with people who thought they could control him, uh, yeah, room's got to go. The Strassers have got to go. So they they murdered a lot of people. That was upwards of a thousand people were at the Lichterfeld barracks. The firing squads were going every ten minutes for Pete's sakes during that purge. Wow. Uh, was the Otto Strasser or was it Gregor Strasser that was murdered? One of the brothers was murdered, and one went to Switzerland to escape. The, but uh, the, the, one of the brothers was shot, and Rum was shot in his cell. Uh, he was shot. One of the guys uh, I forgot. One of the uh, wound up being a concentration camp commander. But uh, he was given a pistol, and he wouldn't do it himself. He says, have Adolf come in and do it. And two SS men came in and shot him in his cell. 
But uh, yeah, it, the the whole. But after that purge, yeah. uh, that's when the Nazis really took power, and uh, because President Hindenburg died and, and Hitler proclaimed himself Führer. So uh, after nineteen after June thirty and Jan July first, nineteen thirty four, Hitler proclaimed himself the savior of Germany. You know, in the hour of need, I rose to the occasion. This type of thing. Okay. Now we look back in history at a microcosm of what everyone probably would fear for their own country, right. that type of thing taking hold. People are going to say, because people make extravagant statements sometimes and, and oversimplify, people could say maybe that, um, that some of that stuff is reemerging, is rearing its ugly head again in 2012 in America. Oh, it has. Okay. It has. Okay. Uh, if, Draw the if, parallels. Well, if you look at the Reichstag fire, mm -hmm. you know, which was uh, blamed on the communists, of course, yeah. the Nazis set the fire. Uh, you know, uh, right after that, the Enabling Act was passed, giving Hitler powers. Now, look. Now, fast okay. forward to two thousand and one. You see, yep. you see uh, the the nine eleven, mm -hmm. and what comes out after that? Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. So there are there are parallels here. You know, however, what I always tell people when they say about the Patriot Act, I say we already had one. It's called the Bill of Rights. Yeah. We've already had a Patriot Act. We've had it for over 200 years. Yeah, uh, and it works. And it works One fairly well when patriotic. it's given a chance to work. And when it is truly patriotic, rather uh, than correct. rather than. Uh, and then you follow this along later on with something like Citizens United, where corporations are able to spend unlimited money, and then they'll say, "Well, their unions are included." Yeah, but the unions have been marginalized in this country. Only eight, eight or nine percent of of of, uh, of of workers in the in the private sector are actually union anymore. And never, never, in fact, have unions ever had the kind of wealth, the kind of Dollar power, correct. That corporations have. I mean, correct. that's the you, the point of unions is to strike a balance between employer and employee, so that you you force them into a, into a stalemate in terms of power, where they'll work together for the betterment of of the company and right. the worker. Well, yeah, I mean, the, I guess. But the, they've never say, had that kind of power. They've never had the kind of financial power that that corporations have had. No, no. It's, well, been, it's been the numbers. Uh, unions, unions, when they arose, had the benefit of having. A lot of members, and it strengthened numbers. Right, but that's that's been that's been diluted now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, has has the uh, has the uh, the 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 uh, business climate changed? Sure, it has. You know, they'll say globalization has changed it. Well, my answer to globalization is. Uh, you know, as far as us being, uh, the, the, I mean, there is somebody like a Ron Paul who would be like like to be more isolationist. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work. You're too tied to the rest of the world. I mean, as I wrote, when I wrote my book on history, a treatise, when I was talking a little bit about the, the yeah. conservative slash isolationist stance of the 1920s, 1930s, mm -hmm. where America, these Americans didn't want to get involved in European affairs after the First World War. Well, if the world was being traversed by wooden sail in 1789, uh, what makes you think the world's not going to be being tra aircraft now come along? Ships have gotten faster. It's not wooden sail anymore. You know, it's 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 oil and steam and aircraft. So, but is at your doorstep pretty quickly? That's correct. If they want to be, which is why, if you look at how the United States geared its military after the First World War, you know, when when uh, when you you get this move toward having a separate air force, the, the air force, the air service in World War One was part of the army umbrella. It was it was part of the army? You know, first you had the the aeronautical division, which was part of the Signal Corps, part of the army. But you, as you look through the night from the First World War through the twenties, through the thirties, you see you see the air you see air power going for greater autonomy. Mm -hmm. These airmen were looking to break out of the army. So as you look at this, you look at strategic air power coming okay. along. Yeah. Strategic air power is important. Why? Because these airmen thought, going back to what we mentioned off camera one time about Dresden. Yeah. This is a culmination of this. The airmen thought, saw strategic air power as a way of stopping the carnage of the First World War, where you had this gridlock, this, this costly gridlock of the trenches yeah. uh, for four years on the Western Front. Yeah. And they weren't going anywhere, just killing, killing humanity. Ah, but if you can take war to the enemy's capacity of waging war, bombing mm -hmm. the, we talked about this before, bombing the factories, yep. bombing the marshalling yards, bo bombing the rail, rail centers, bombing the ports. You, if, if you stop the enemy's capacity for making war, it'll make war less costly in the long run. This was the idea of strategic bombing, and this was the idea of having a separate air force. However, that didn't quite work out. You know, 
the airplane has not had not been able to win war on its own because in the end you're going to have to take a man with a rifle to occupy what's left. Right, the airplanes can't occupy. Correct. But did it help? Of course it helped. Did it win the war? No. But it did it help? Yes, it was a valuable contribution to victory in the Second World War. So it's kind of a great neutralizer. I mean, you know, you you, you couldn't it made it a lot easier for a fewer numbers of individuals, or in the case nowadays with um, with with the um, the drones. Correct. You don't need to have great numbers of individuals to um, to attack somebody else. Right. I mean, yeah. Now, now you 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 hear well. You hear these stories. You just read them in the newspaper. Somebody in Las Vegas pushing a button, sending a drone into Afghanistan mm-hmm. from the United States, and killing somebody there. Uh, yeah, has it made war impersonal? Yeah, it has. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. somebody goes to work 8 o'clock in the morning, leaves 5 o'clock in the afternoon, has launched maybe a few drones and goes home. <clears throat> you know, he's not on the ground. Yeah. In, he uh, doesn't see the result of it. He correct. doesn't see the carnage that arises right. out of his pushing a button. Neither did, the, neither did the bombardier dropping bombs from a B-17. Mm-hmm. Sure, he could see the picture. He could see, the, he could see the, the bombs exploding. He's not on the ground. He's not seeing, he's not seeing people blowing Correct. bits. However, as opposed to the fellow firing a drone, mm-hmm. this is a guy, a bombardier, who had to take his chances flying over enemy territory. He took a chance on being shot down. Yeah. Uh, and and from what, in the interviews I've seen of men who've flown those missions in mm-hmm. World War II, yeah. oh yeah, they'll even say war was impersonal. It's not like that eyeball to eyeball combat in a foxhole. Mm-hmm. It's different. You're not seeing the person you're killing, or who's trying to kill you. Uh, but we have advanced over the years from you know somebody you know hitting somebody with a rock or a club or sticking them with a knife to the bow and arrow to the cannon mm-hmm. now to the aircraft and now to the drones we've seen man's capacity to kill has enlarged in our society so uh, but now we're going back to this pinpoint aspect now with the drone so instead of using a bow and arrow to kill one person we're now using a drone to kill 10 20 30 40 or 50 so we have gone from atomic weapon mm-hmm. now to back to a drone in a more sophisticated manner of of surgically killing people what is the united states military capacity relative to other countries no we spend a lot more money on on, mili- on the military than other countries fair enough do. but do we have do we, what do we have to show for do we have the the superior we have obviously the nuclear superiority over Probably any other country, I would imagine. Not that you need more than X numbers of uh, nuclear weapons to, um, to to end it all for everybody. But right. um, well, yeah, um, it's not. You know, it's like ha- you know, like it's it's like the, some people that are against guns. Guns kill people. Then there's the counter argument. Well, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Pe- people. And yeah. to a certain extent, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh-huh. They don't need a gun. I mean, I read a, a what was it not a, a, a what was it last year? Some guy stuck up a store with a snake in New York. <laughs> but but gra- granted, but it is a lot easier when you've got a gun. Of course, a gun. Yeah, uh, yeah. you can and, project and you, power a lot farther uh, with a gun than you can with a snake. I and, understand that. right. And with when with a trigger next to your finger, you could certainly. Um, you can certainly make make quicker decisions as far as um, as far uh, killing becomes less um, maybe less personal, but also less um, less thought needs to go into it. Well, I guess you, you don't could have say, to plot and plan too much like you do with what poison, let's say. Well, I guess you could say you know killing is you know is uh, the more you do, it's like links in a chain. It becomes easier to do after mm-hmm. a while. But yes, the United States ha- has 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 this power that it can project, and it can project on a global. On a, on, a, on a global way. I mean, the Great White Fleet in 1907, I gave a talk on that last night. Mm-hmm. This, was, this was the announcement that the United States, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's announcement that the United States had become a global power because he sent 16 battleships on a round the world cruise. Well, extend that to today. You know, mm-hmm. ma- now we've gone from coal burning battleships, which Teddy Roosevelt sent around the world. And this is right after the Spanish American War. Uh, correct. Mm-hmm. But the, you know, yeah, we 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 joined the ranks of the of the imperialist powers with the Spanish American War, but we joined the ranks of the glo- we became a global power with this naval, with, because in, in the in the Spanish American War we didn't have that capability. We did have it nine years later. We could transport uh, transport uh, armaments and troops and everything else around the globe as fast as anybody else. Well, yeah, back then though the ar- the army was still in pretty poor shape as compared to the navy. I mean, the the, the navy was the accepted was the darling son. The army was the red-haired stepchild back then. Hmm. Uh, but 
but the fact of the matter is we've shown we've advanced, the technology has advanced uh, to the way that we can project power today as opposed to 1907. It's not, <clears throat> it's not, I don't think, so much American military power as opposed to how we're using it, and that's the political, that goes back to the political end. Do I believe that, the polit that civilians should control the military in the end? Yes. But it's up to the American public to elect the correct people right. to employ them military in a correct manner in leg for legitimate American interest. So by and extension, we're not getting that. So by extension, the population of the United States through the power of the ballot box correct. controls what its military does. That's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 9-11, uh, you know, when, the, when the, the Twin Towers were, were hit by those aircraft, uh, you know, that's not 1941. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we were, were we attacked? Yeah, we were attacked in 2000. But it's our reaction to it. You know, Iraq had nothing to do with that. <laughs> you know, history, you know, whatever happens, history will never say Iraq attacked the United States. There's a lot of people that would say that probably still. But obviously those people are, are lack of a better word, lying. Well, yeah, but deluding uh, themselves and trying to delude others along with themselves. Well, I, I had a, in my book on history, a treatise. I had a string of quotes. That's how I started the book off. Mm -hmm. And one of the quotes was, I, I put quotes from very famous people, but one of the quotes was my own, and I put on there, Iraq. No, no, history, history will never say Iraq attacked the United States. The other quote I put in there in the beginning was, you know, history doesn't lie; people do. <laughs> <laughs> True, the facts are the facts are the facts, and correct interpretation of the facts sometimes uh, can correct. vary. But but yeah, 1941, like my father said, we knew what we were fighting for. Mm -hmm. We knew what we were fighting for. Yeah, uh, you know the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and we were off and running here. Uh, but you could say what you want. The Japanese attacked a military target. Mm -hmm. You know, Pearl Harbor was a military target. That's where the Navy base was. There were a lot of Army aircraft there. There were troops there, and they wanted to cut off. Uh, Something to do with oil and uh, we're well, in the, it's in, cutting off the supply of oil right. from Indonesia to Japan. Which well, on July 26, 1941, uh, Roosevelt uh, cut off, uh, froze Japanese assets mm -hmm. so they, could, they were no longer able to get, get oil from the United States. And, uh, and the, the British and the Dutch government in exile followed suit. And what happened here was, however, the Dutch oil interests said, well, you know, told the Japanese, if you can come up with the cash, we'll, we'll give you the oil. <laughs> oil! <laughs> Well, that's Dang. what it comes down to. Dang. You know, and when you tell, and when, and when I give and when talks away, and I tell people this, well, you know, Pearl, one of the reasons Pearl Harbor was mined for oil, they're like, well, there's no oil in Hawaii. No, it's not. It's in the Dutch East Indies, which yeah. is now, which is now uh, Indonesia, Burma, Malaya. That's, that's what the and Japanese we, want. That's why we have to get away from oil, which is, of course, concentrated in certain spots in the globe, and get on to more alternative. It always comes back to the energy nowadays, it appears. It always has, perhaps. With that, we're going to have to say goodbye for, uh, for today. Uh, this has been Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson. Mark Albertson, again, visiting us and talking about history. And uh, enjoy your afternoon.